And welcome back to Pastor Ong. Thank you for that. Welcome to the Northwest students and also to the GRC students. Woo! We're so happy for the GRC students and the Northwest students who are here. That speaks to us of life getting back to a new normal, a better normal than it ever was before. Amen? Are you excited to be here today? I tell you, God is here, and he's about to do something amazing, right? He's really about to do something amazing, and the enemy thinks he can do all sorts of things to stop us, but he can't. Amen? Because we're, we're on it. We're on it. Praise God. Well, I would like to welcome any new visitors. If you've never been here before, we welcome you. And if you didn't get a red bag, then we ask that you can see one of the ushers. They'll give you a red bag. It has some goodies inside it. And uh, we're just so thankful you're here. If you do not have another church body to attend, please feel free to come back. We're here in person and online. And speaking of in person and online, there's a small little offering Thing at the back if you have online offering you're more than welcome to drop it in there but if you want to do it online you can do it online as well God is so faithful now this week there will be life groups again we're excited about our life groups and I would encourage you to get plugged into a life group also tonight pursue youth at 5 30 and it's a movie night Woo! so uh if, if you're a youth or you want to pretend to be a youth, you are more than welcome to come, all right? It's going to be an exciting time. And then there's prayer meetings on Wednesday. Who likes prayer meeting? I love prayer meeting. Come. It's not what you think. It is beyond what you think. It's amazing. I'm going to invite Pastor Rick right now to uh, come and tell us about the return prayer on the 26th of September. I'm here to tell you about it, to invite you to it, and to encourage you to come because it's going to be a simulcast of praying together with some, some people that guy by the name of Kevin, Kevin Jessup and Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn have, have felt the Lord has called them together to organize a prayer time for churches throughout the United States to pray for our nation and the nations of the world. So we're going to come together in two Saturdays, the 26th, Saturday the 26th at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'll be here at 8.30 to open up the door. We're going to start at 9. We're going to get hooked up with churches from all over the United States praying for our nation. And they're going to be leading. They're going to be doing everything through the broadcast. So we're just going to participate. We're going to pray for our nation. And we've been hearing lots of prophecies about what God wants to do at the end of this year but they're all conditional. If my people who are called by my name, so we got to get together and really seriously seek God and find out what he's got planned for us to do and what he wants us to do. So I want to encourage you, we're going to be here. ICC is going to host the simulcast. We're part of churches from all over the nation. So if you want to be a part of it, please come. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And now I'd like to invite... Uh, Miss Celeste, she's coming. She's our beloved woman's coordinator, and she's going to come and announce about the retreat. Can we have the slide up, please? Thank you. Ladies in the house, thank you. Oh. So we, you already know that we have finally doing this. We've had many postponements and all changes and all that, so we are having a women's conference on October 16, that's in the evening of Friday, and October 17 from 9 a.m. upwards. And we have our special speaker. Next slide, Miss Car Miss Carolyn Ross. Pastor already um, told us about her life story. If you think you're having problems, she had a lot of problems, and with God's help, she was over to over. She was able to overcome. So she is able to minister to us. I was praying to the Lord and saying. Lord, we kind of know that we're surrounded. We already, you know, we're Christians. We know the word. We're kind of filled up. But I think what he wants is for us to reach out to 
the, the, the angriest person around us, maybe in our workplace, because that person may be the, most one, the, the one that is more, most fearful, the one who is having attitude, because that's the person who needs the Lord most. So let's um, step out in faith. I think the Lord is putting up the temperature, uh, literally, all these fires, for us to have a platform to go out and like really step up and invite people to uh, worship him in spirit and in truth. Thank you. So sign up in the back, please. Thank you. And those of you who have already registered the first time, May, thank you, excited. Um, please, again, re-register. That was $60. Now it's only $20, so there's a $40 thing. You might want to donate that. There are people who already are donating and paying for other ladies to come. So please come. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And that registration will end on the 27th, so you have lots of time. Uh, please do register 16 and above, right? We're excited about this upcoming uh, program. Praise God. Even if you're not able to come for the full time, say, oh, I can't come on Friday because I work on Friday. And you say, I can only come Saturday. Register because you don't want to miss even a part of this. Let's turn to John chapter 11. I would like to thank God that my husband's sitting on the front row here. Okay, uh, for the men, uh, for the uh, re return uh, prayer time, you need to sign up to be a part of that, okay? So don't forget to sign up for that as well. Don't forget to sign up for that. All right. John chapter 11, and we're going to read from verses 1 through 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Martha who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. <laughs> Wait, one second. Deanna, I'm in the middle of preaching right now. I'll call you back later. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. Therefore, the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going to go there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go to wake him up. Father, right now we just thank you for the reading of your word. And we thank you because we know that this message is one that needs to go out today. And Father God, I just thank you for your word, every single one of your words that you have given. But the greatest word of all, Jesus Christ incarnate, I just thank you for what he did on the cross. And I ask that today he will become so real to each and every one of us here in a way that we never thought possible. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We have the pleasure of reading this story now so we know the end of it, right? But those who were living through this story did not know the end of it. And that's how many of us are at this present moment. Because we are living through something that we don't know what the end is going to be. But let's see some truths that we find in this story to see how we should be responding to our story that we're going through right now. You know, it's interesting because it said, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he heard that he was sick, he delayed two days. Hmm. He delayed two days. How many of you feel sometimes Jesus is delaying 
in your life. <laughs> okay, be honest. I see a lot of hypocrites in here without their hands raised. <laughs> There's a lot of times you think, hey, Lord, I need it now. I need it now. But he'll just delay a little bit longer. And you see, he delayed because he, you see in verse 4, he knew this was for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified. He already knew the outcome. So he didn't need to rush. He didn't need to be flurried or desperate. He was calm. And he delayed. Now, Let's look at something really interesting. In verse 3, the messenger comes and says, Therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Okay? That word love is phileo. It's a brotherly love. It's a friendship love. That kind of love that can often be turned with emotion or compulsiveness. That's a love for a companion, a friend, or a brother. It's a love that, hey, today you're so nice to me and wonderful to me, but tomorrow you aren't, so I'm not going to love you anymore. It's a love that sometimes is there and sometimes isn't there. It's a love that we never know if we can truly count on that kind of love. How many of you have experienced that? It's brought a lot of pain in a lot of our lives, isn't it? Because those we think loved us, they suddenly decided they don't love us anymore. Those we think loved us suddenly decided their love wasn't big enough to cover whatever we're going through at that moment. That's the phileo love. But look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, I'll have to put my glasses back on. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And then in verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, he delayed two days. Now, this love is agape love. If you look it up in the Greek, this is a different love. It's agape love. And you say, well, what's the difference? Because this love cannot be swayed by anything. This love is not a love that is, oh, you're good, so I love you. You're bad, so I don't love you. This love loves no matter what. This is not just an emotion. This is a fact. This is a choice. This is a love. This is the same word used when Jesus said, love your enemies. It's the same one. It says it doesn't matter how you feel about your enemy. It doesn't matter if you're angry with your enemy. Love them. Choose to love them. This love doesn't change. This love cannot change. In fact, the meaning of it denotes a love of reason that loves unconditionally. It's the love that caused God to send his only begotten son for us when we were still in our sins. It's the love that caused Jesus to be willing to die on the cross for us when people were betraying him. He was able to love. Now you say, oh, but then that means I have to just love anybody no matter what they're doing. You see, we get confused here because this is a state of being. It's a state of love. He loved us so much. He doesn't want us in our sin. He loved us so much. He knows that our sin is going to destroy us. And so he loves us enough to say, you need me to be free from your sin. He loved us so much that he's not going to be manipulated into doing stuff for us if he knows it's not for our benefit. That's how much he loves us. This for us in our human comprehension, it blows our mind. We can't understand it. Why? Because we're so used to love that has price tags on it. We're so used to love that has some kind of a hook in it or a manipulation. Okay, if you do what I want, then I will love you. But if you don't do what I want, then I'm not going to love you. If you really loved me, how many girls have heard this? If you really loved me, you'd sleep with me. You tell that guy, if you really love me, you'd shut up. Okay? All right? That's not love. When it tries to coerce, is it? God's love is solid. He loves us through thick and thin. He doesn't give in to us, and we see that here. What did he do? He waited. 
two more days. If it was an earthly love, he'd, oh, quickly, that's me. Quick, pack everything. I got to go. Ah, everything's flurried. And then we make a lot of mistakes. No, he was calm. He says, we're going to wait two more days. Let me tell you a little secret. By the time Jesus got to Lazarus, he was in the tomb four days. That can only mean that it took the messenger one day to get to him. He delayed two days, and it took him one day to get back to the messenger. That means the minute the messenger left, Lazarus died. He was already dead when the messenger came and talked to Jesus. And Jesus knew that. There was no rush. He's not going to get any more dead than what he was that first day, was he? And Jesus knew that. And sometimes in our life, there's things that we're like, you got to do it now. you got to do it now. And the Lord says, no, for your benefit, I'm going to delay. For the sake of Mary, Martha, and the disciples, he said, for your benefit, I'm going to delay because I want your faith to increase. For the sake of the elevation of our faith, there's sometimes delays. Just this uh, week, Pastor went for a major surgery. And after the surgery, he seemed really good, except he couldn't urinate. I got his permission to tell this. <laughs> and so they said, okay, we're going to have to send you home with a catheter. Who has ever had a catheter? If you haven't, you will never want one, right? <laughs> okay, so he tried his level best. We stayed till almost 9.30 that night trying to see if he could. We went multiple trips to the bathroom. We were praying. I was praying in tongues in the bathroom. I didn't care who heard me. I wanted him to urinate before we got home, but no, it didn't come. It delayed. And so poor guy, he had to go home with a catheter that night. But I tell you, the Lord did something wonderful. In the morning, he said to me, I feel there's been a change. I feel there's been a change. So we're going to call the doctor and see if they'll allow us to remove the catheter and then see what happens. So I called the doctor and they said, okay, you can remove it, but you have six hours. He has to urinate within six hours. Otherwise, you have to go back to that emergency room and then you're going to have to reinsert that catheter. <gasps> One hour passed, two hour passed, three hours passed. We were in, going towards the fourth hour, and I was not wanting to be around him. I didn't want to ask, have you gone yet? Have you gone yet? You know, when you're waiting for something, you don't want to keep asking somebody, hey, if it's happened, they'll let you know, right? So there, you know, I, I went upstairs, and I told uh, Cassandra, I said, Cassandra, time's ticking. And two more hours, we're going to have to go back to that emergency room. He's tried. Nothing's happening, man. And, you know, she said, well, the Bible says anoint with oil and we're going to pray. I had sent out texts to every single person I could think of to say, pray, pray, pray. And so we went downstairs. We laid hands on him. Cassandra laid hands on him. And she said, in Jesus' name, I command this urine. You start coming out of him in Jesus' name. She walked upstairs. Before she was upstairs, he had gone to the bathroom and it had happened praise God praise God but let me tell you something our faith grew in that delay you know why because we take urinating so for granted don't we so if he had if he had you know at the hospital after an hour or so if he had done it it would be like no miracle this is life this is what happens we wouldn't have even known that it was a testimony to praise God about. But now, let me tell you, I have a testimony, amen? Something that God did. He wants to elevate our faith. Daniel had to go into the lion's den to elevate his faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fire to elevate his faith. David fought all sorts of wild beasts and Goliath. To elevate his faith. And Moses was brought to the edge of the water. With mountains on both sides. And an enemy crashing behind him. And it elevated his faith. To believe my God can make a way. Where there seems to be no way. Are you in that time of delay? Where you feel like. There is no escape. There is no way out. The Lord is saying, I can make a way where there seems to be no way. I can do the impossible. I can bring the dead to life. I am able to do it. He is more than able to do it. But let's look at the responses. Let's look at from verses 7 down to 16. It 
It says, then after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. Then his disciples said, listen carefully, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest. Then Jesus said it very plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not. I am glad. Look at that. <laughs> How do you feel when you're in a delay and Jesus says, I'm glad that you're having to wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Are we Thomas? Are we Thomases? And let's not give him too hard of a time because he didn't know the end of the story, right? But Thomas tended to have this very negative slant, right? We see it throughout. Doubting Thomas. That's why we call him Doubting Thomas. <laughs> we see that he tended to see everything in the negative. But, you know, Jesus was right there. Jesus had plainly said, I am going to go to wake him up. Jesus had plainly said, this is to glorify me. He had made it so plain. How much plainer could he have made it? But because of a delay, Thomas said, let's just go ahead and die too. How many of us are like that? How many of us feel like that? We just want to give up. We feel hopeless. We can't go a step further. Thomas walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He spent time with Jesus. And now he had seen Jesus and all his miracles and yet now, he chose to feel hopeless. He had forgotten everything that Christ had done thus far. And he just wanted to give up. Maybe he also forgot that in Mark 5, 36, Jesus said, don't be afraid, only believe. When the enemy wants to come and tell us that we can't do something, that God has already promised us that he's going to do, you need to tell that enemy to back off. And you're not going to give in to feeling down or discouraged. When I woke up this morning, I hardly had a voice. I don't know why. Maybe the air or what. I don't know what it was. And my husband said, oh, Lord. <laughs> are you gonna be? I said, in Jesus' name, if I have to croak this message out, it's coming out. <laughs> don't care. This message is going to come out there. Nothing is going to stop this from coming out because that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to play with our thoughts. He wants to play with our emotions. He wants to tell us we're defeated before we even start. And that's where Thomas was. He was just like, okay, let's give up. Okay. Let's look at, at Martha. What was her response in verses 21 to 28? It says, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you're the Christ, the son of God who came into the world. And when she had said these things, she went away secretly to call her sister Mary. The reason I read that last verse was that she says, yes, I believe. But then she quickly goes and calls Mary. And like, okay, he, he's going crazy. You, you need to go and see what's up here. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Are we like Martha where we question him? If only. Why? Why? Where were you? Have we misunderstood what Jesus is saying very plainly to us? He said to Martha, I am going to raise him up 
And what does she do? What does she do? She says, yeah, I know, you're the resurrection. Her theology was accurate, wasn't it? Her theology was so correct. Some of us, our theology is so correct. It blurs what Jesus is telling us. It's nothing wrong with our theology. It's good. But Jesus is trying to tell us something right at that moment. And we're like, oh, no, I know better than you. <laughs> I know what you're really saying, Jesus. He's like, no, don't try to symbolize it. Don't try to contextualize it for all you Bible school students. Just hear what I'm saying. Have faith to believe of what I'm saying. Know that I can do the impossible. Wow. We mustn't allow our theology to obscure the truth of the very person who the theology is all about, right? In James chapter 2 from verses 18 and 20, it tells us that the devils believe in God. So just to say, oh, yeah, I believe in God, like Martha, I believe but then she ran off to get Mary. Mary, come here. I need backup. He doesn't know what he's talking about. How many of us are like that when we're really put into a place? We're not sure what he's really going to do. Even though he's screaming it at us, he's telling us what he's going to do. How about Mary? Let's look at verses 32 to 33. In 32 to 33, then it said, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and he was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Now, Mary, this is the closest one. Remember, this is the one that chose the best thing to sit at Jesus' feet, to commune with Jesus, to be in intimate relationship with Jesus. But even she, sorrow and grief overtook her to the point that she said, she accused him. If only you'd been here, he would have been alive. Even in her intimacy, she did not recognize who he really was and what he was able to do. And how many of us had, have allowed sorrow and grief to, to distract us and to sidetrack us into really knowing who he is and what he can do in our lives. No matter how long that may take. To believe that you are able and you will do it. He is able. How many of us have asked the same question? Why did you delay? What were you thinking? What were you doing? And do we forget that it says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as high as the heaven is from the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Remember his love, the agape love? It will blow our mind because his love loves us no matter what. And we don't understand that because we think we have to work for his love, don't we? We think we have to jump through hoops for his love. His love is there. And it's his love that will work in us and through us to do good. Praise God. It's his love. If we can really capture his real love, then that's where the transformation takes place. Because we're not changing to get his love. We're changing because we have already gotten his love. Do you see the difference? It's like this transformational shift. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. How many of us believe God knows everything? He's omniscient. How many of us know that? But then sometimes in our lives, we don't act that way, do we? Because when he comes to try to tell us something, what do we do? We argue with him. Uh, no, Lord, you don't understand. I know your, ver your Bible says this is truth. But I think maybe it is not culturally evident for today. Hey, it's truth. 
It was truth then, and it's truth now. It didn't change because of the time, all right? If he said it was sin then, it's sin now. His love is there showing us truth. His love is there helping us to walk in truth. His love is there causing us to understand his ways and his thoughts. How many of you have kids that are doing virtual classroom? Yeah, okay. I'm praying for you extra hard this week. I have a couple grandkids in my house that are doing the virtual thing with their Renton Park School here. And one of my grandkids, Caleb, he's in kindergarten. Put a kindergartner in front of a, not a show, but a teacher trying to teach you for almost two and a half hours, all right? And I'm telling you, the teacher will be telling him things. I would be there, you know, somebody had to be next to him to make sure he's doing what he's supposed to do. And the teacher's telling him because she knows what she wants. But he's there. Of course, he's muted. Thank you, Jesus. There's a mute. He's going, no, no, I'm not going to do that, teacher. Uh, 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 miss, uh, no, no, I, I'll do it this way. I'm like, Caleb, stop it. I'm here behind the screen. Ah! Do what she's telling you. She knows better. No, no, no. No, Grams, I'm not going to do it. I think I'm going to go out and play right now. You are not going out to play. <laughs> and that's sometimes how we are with the Lord, isn't it? He's telling us things. He's saying, listen, I have this plan for you. This is what I'm going to do for you. And we're like, no, nope, no, nope, I know better. If only, if you would have. We think our ways and our thoughts are higher than his ways and his thoughts. They aren't. Let's see someone who did listen to him. Let's go to verse 39 to 44. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said, Lord, by this time the stench, he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who were standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who was dead came out and bound hand and foot with the grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. The only one that heard Jesus was the dead one. <laughs> He's the only one that not only heard, but he obeyed. Sometimes we've got to be really dead before we start listening, right? Because when we're too alive, we think we can reason with God. But this tells us no matter how dead the situation is that you're in, no matter how hopeless, if we will just listen to his voice and obey what he's saying, he will bring life into the situation. He will bring life into the situation. And okay, you say, oh, but he had to be unbound. Yes, but the life started. There would have been no unbounding if the death was still there. But he had to listen to what Jesus said. He had to obey what Jesus said and hop out there. And the life was evident. And then the unbinding can come. And how many of us, we are in that situation where we need the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit to speak into us and give us the life that we need. And then the healing process will begin. The miracle will happen happen because of what Christ has done he's able he's more than able I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward and before I close I want to just read a testimony very quickly in John eleven forty, it said if you would only believe you will see the glory of God I read this testimony on Wednesday night at the prayer meeting but there was a follow-up uh, a follow-up update, so I'd like to be able to read the entire testimony with the follow-up update. This was a man. Who about two weeks ago, I think it was, 10 days ago, 
he was eating with his family and he dropped dead. And by the time they rushed him to the hospital, he was unconscious. And after a couple days, they figured out he was 100% brain dead. They did multiple tests on him and they found out he was brain dead. And now I'm going to read you the testimony. Sister Margaret, that's my mom. My brother-in-law, Victor, who was pronounced 100% brain dead on Monday, woke up from the coma this morning. The swelling in his brain is completely gone. He was able to recognize his wife and communicate by nodding or shaking his head. He couldn't speak with the tubes in his throat, but he was able to wave and wiggle his toes. The doctors are all surprised. Now listen to the next update. Thank you for your prayers. The Lord is working wonders and we are overwhelmed by his goodness. Victor is now off the ventilator and completely breathing on his own. A team of doctors, pulmonologists, respiratory technicians came in to observe him. They just stood there shocked for 20 minutes. And after a few deep breaths, he is breathing fine. He asked for a drink of water because his throat was dry. He even asked for Sprite but they wouldn't give that to him. They would only let him have chips, ice chips. He's talking perfectly. His memory and recollection is, recollection is good. He even asked my sister-in-law about the sale of their house if it had gone through because it had closed two days before this incident happened. He also asked why he was in the hospital. My sister-in-law had to explain to him and the doctor told him that with his consent, they would be putting in a pacemaker. Now listen to the final installment this just came you have been such a blessing thank you for praying and thank your daughters for praying too I've experienced the power of God in a way I never thought possible my sister-in-law went to visit Victor Saturday evening this is in Houston he's in America in case you're thinking oh maybe he was in a country that they don't know how to know if they're brain dead okay this was in Houston all right and to her surprise, the doctor said they have briefed him on his discharge instructions and he's ready to go home. She had asked that they keep him one more night so she could prepare because she wasn't ready for him to come back. Two weeks ago, he had been declared 100% brain dead. Today, the doctors have said there's no damage whatsoever to his brain. He's fit and he's healthy and he's able to walk out and go home. Our God is a miracle worker. Rise up right now. Stand up. And if there's anything in your life right now that you've been, been like Thomas thinking, let me just give up and die right now. Right now, just think of that thing. And as we begin to worship, you just allow Jesus to speak into your situation. Allow Jesus to come in and speak to you and tell you exactly what you're supposed to be doing right now. Thank you, Lord. Just lift up your hand with me right now. Father, bless your people as they go today. Lord, I thank you for the miracle. I thank you for the healing in our body, in our soul, our spirit. I thank you for all that you have done for each and every one of us. Father, we rejoice. Lord, we rejoice in you. Bless them. Bless your people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>